Hi, this is Robert Rapier from R Squared, and this is R Squared Energy TV. In this week's episode, we're going to cover two topics. One is fairly simple and straightforward, and that's about compressed natural gas vehicles. The other one is a lot more complicated, and that is about the science behind global warming. So let's take the easy one first. What do you think about the role that CNG vehicles might play in the next 10 years? Can you compare the environmental footprint of a CNG vehicle that burns gas directly versus an electric car that uses electricity produced from gas? Uh, another reader did answer that question, and he answered it in a way that's pretty consistent with the way I would have answered it. And he said that the uh, overall uh, life cycle analysis, the environmental footprint, would show them to be about the same. 20% um, efficiency for the direct burn in an internal combustion engine. I may put that a little bit higher versus 60% uh, efficiency of natural gas to electricity conversion, and that may be a little on the high side, uh, and then transmission losses and 80% efficiency of charging and driving. So, you know, they're in the ballpark. They're, they're close, to, close to being the same. Um, as, as the reader points out, you know, one of the advantages to the electric car would be that if you didn't have the gas, you could actually get the electricity some other way. So it, it opens up more options for you as far as... Uh, uh, using using the electricity, whereas if you had a CNG vehicle, you might be pretty uh, stuck with uh, stuck with that. Uh, the role they may play in the next 10 years, if I was a fleet owner, I think this would be a no-brainer. I mean, the differential between natural gas prices and oil prices right now is an order of magnitude difference. So, uh, you know, if I owned a fleet, I'd try to lock in natural gas prices where they are right now, and then you know you've got substantial savings uh, for years to come. I did this calculation a few years ago for someone, and it turned out that uh, natural gas had to be about $8 a million BTUs uh, before his break-even exceeded like three years. So, uh, you know, at the, at the price where they are right now, if you have a fleet owner and you drive many miles, you'd probably pay out the conversion in a year. For personal cars, I mean, it depends on how many, how many miles you drive. I think for most people, it well, you will have to drive quite a few miles for, to pay out because the price difference, I think, is still, you know, eight to $10,000 for between a CNG vehicle and a gasoline engine. And that's largely, my understanding is, because of EPA licensing requirements for, for uh, stations that actually convert these vehicles. Um, <clears throat> so, again, uh, I think the, the long story short, fleet owners, no-brainer, personal cars, probably not uh, for most people. And then uh, the electric car running off gas produced electricity is probably a better, uh, a, a more environment, has a lower environmental footprint. So now onto the tough question. Can you do an episode on global warming? This topic is extremely confusing to me and I can't decipher through the fabrications from both sides. Um, it goes on to ask about the effect of the increase in temperature. Is this controversy motivated by politics or inconsistent scientific theory? Why have the models not accurately predicted the temperature? Um, people ask me a lot uh, why I don't tackle this topic, and uh, I do write some about global warming. What I don't write is about the science, uh, either supporting or, or uh, denying the science behind global warming. I, I don't, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, I've dug into this a little bit at times, and like the reader, it's very confusing. I mean, I, I find it very confusing. Uh, being not an expert in the field, you know, if I read the people putting out the, uh, you know, the, the scientific models and the basis of their models and the evidence that warming, it, it all seems pretty reasonable. But then I always like to go and read the other side. And you see the other side poking holes in, um, in, in some, of those, some of those ideas. And so as, a, as kind of a lay person in that field, it becomes pretty hard for me, too, to determine, you know, is, are, are those holes legitimate or are they... Uh, you know, are, are they really based soundly in, in science? And to really get deeply into this and really make a, 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 you know, an intelligent decision one way or the other, I would have to spend a lot more time uh, researching this issue. I've always taken the position that I believe in scientific consensus, but scientific consensus is sometimes wrong. It's not usually wrong, but it's sometimes wrong. So I've always thought that it's important to keep an open mind here. I've always uh, hated some of the tactics here, and, and it goes on both sides, but um, I think the people, I think it's, it goes on more so from the people who are pushing uh, man-made climate change. You know, they tend to label 
their opponents as deniers and anti-science. And, and there's some of these people that use really uh, derogatory language and bullying tactics for, you know, in, in my opinion, some, you know, some of these guys have legitimate skepticism. I mean, they, they and, and it's based on, you know, legitimate uh, reasons. And I've always said, you can't say the science is settled. You have to say, you know, science is never settled. It, it, it continues to uh, evolve as more data come in. And so, you know, the, the subject itself, you know, the global warming effect is fairly easy to understand. In fact, the global warming effect is why the Earth is at the temperature it's at, because water vapor in the atmosphere helps heat the Earth up. And so as humans burn uh, fossil fuels, carbon dioxide goes up. We measure that. We know that that's happening. And based on what we understand of the greenhouse effect, sunlight comes, the, the light comes through the atmosphere and it heats up the earth and then it's radiated in infrared radiation back into the atmosphere. And the infrared radiation interacts differently with the atmosphere than the radiation that passed through. And some of that is irradiated back to the earth. And so this ends up raising the temperature of the earth somewhat. And so we understand that as CO2 concentrations go up, the earth should warm up a little bit. And I think even most skeptics will agree that this is true. Where they will get into some disagreement is the extent. And, and where it really gets complicated is when you start talking about the feedback mechanisms. And, and this is really where there's a lot of disagreement on both sides. Um, proponents of catastrophic climate change will say that the feedback mechanisms will exacerbate and will uh, um, be sort of a multiplier. So if you just calculate what CO2 emissions might do, you're going to come in lower than what the actual temperature is going to be based on these uh, multiplicative um, uh, effects, such as an example would be as permafrost in Siberia heats up, there's methane that's locked into the, into the soil, it's released in the atmosphere, and therefore it causes more warming that might be expected from just the CO2 in the atmosphere. There's also the ocean, which is a buffer. It absorbs uh, CO2 as the CO2 goes up. And that's also a problem because the ocean, as they absorb CO2, uh, the acidity starts to increase. And, and that's another potential problem. Now, personally, I don't think it's a good idea to experiment with the atmosphere. Um, you know, whether we know or don't know, I, I think one of the problems that, uh, you know, proponents have gotten themselves in trouble, they uh, put too much certainty behind their models. And, and these are models, mind you. These are, uh, you know, we're making assumptions, we're, we're, we're developing models, and yet, you know, you can't on the base of models say the science is settled. We can say the science is compelling, uh, but we're not going to stop looking at the science. And proponents have also got themselves into a little bit of trouble in the Peter Gleick situation recently where he, uh, you know, decided to go undercover and, and uh, infiltrate the Heartland Institute. And it, that, that doesn't look good. I mean, it, it looks like scientists are not being objective. And a lot of people think that that's the case, that they are uh, acting as advocates and in some cases exaggerating the science. And, you know, an example I use is, is Jim Hansen who famously said, you know, if the oil sands are developed in Canada, it's game over for the planet. And there's a paper that recently came out that said if all those reserves in Canada, the oil sands were burned, it would be expected to raise a global temperature by 1 20th of a degree C. So Hansen's exaggeration is not helpful to the cause. It, it says, uh, you know, that they're willing to stretch the truth. Now, if he said, look, you know, the real problem, and I've said this before, is in Asia Pacific, where carbon emissions there are going up like crazy. You know, in the U.S. and in, in Europe over the last 10 years, carbon emissions have been pretty flat. In Asia Pacific, they're going up like crazy, and uh, there's no end in sight. And if you said, you know, the real carbon bomb is uh, and, and game over for the planet could be the coal that's being burned in Asia Pacific, you might have a, a more legitimate argument. But to say that the oil sands, uh, the, the, the contribution of the oil sands is relatively minor compared to what's going on with the burning of the coal. And to, you know, put all the emphasis on the oil sands as if that's game over for the planet, it really hurts credibility. So, um, you know, it, it's as I say, I don't believe we should be experimenting with the with the climate. Um, so what if what if uh, what if they are right? You know, what if uh, it, it could be that, you know, we have, you know, several degree temperature rise and, you know, catastrophic effects. You know, we, we don't get a chance to do that experiment over again. On the other hand, I don't see really that we have a good handle for stopping this. 
And, you know, I wrote about it in my book. I showed what's going on with the carbon emissions in developing countries uh, to really, you know, put, uh, you know, put it in perspective as far as the West goes and what's going on in the developing world. So, you know, if we fix all our problems in the West, it does not fix the problem uh, overall. And so in the book, I talk about, you know, I, I liken it to, to trying to stop a hurricane. You know, a hurricane can be coming in and you can see it and you can predict that the damage will be severe and you can try to prepare for it, but you don't really have a way to stop it. So I, I kind of look at the global warming thing that way. I don't see a good handle on how we actually stop this. So even though I accept the science behind uh, climate change, I do think there's been some exaggerations, and I don't like the language that's used in the debate. But then I don't, I don't see really how we're going to fix it. Um, so you know, I have chosen not to focus in that area. I do write about it a little bit, but uh, you know, it it really is a complex subject. It's not something that uh, you know, skimming a few headlines should give you, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't feel confident that you understand this one way or another. It really is complicated, and I've I've spent time looking at both sides and. Uh, that's what you should do. You know, you should, you know, the, the proponents will say the skeptics are all anti-science. I think you should understand what the skeptics position is and, um, you know, and, and, and read the rebuttals back and forth. And that's what I've tried to do. But it's, it is complicated enough that I don't feel comfortable wading out into that arena and, and you know, taking a side. So uh, I hope that helped. Um, it's, a, it's a confusing topic for, for everybody. Uh, except maybe climate scientists don't feel like they're confused about it. And there are some people on the other side that don't feel like they're confused about it. Uh, but for most of us in the middle, it is somewhat confusing. So uh, with that, that's this week's episode. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.